Okay, so we reached to the respiratory diseases, we reached to the, um, how we distinguish uh, um, a respiratory failure from respiratory disease status uh, based on the area that we are assessing, whether it's airway or breathing or circulation or disability or exposure. Um, and then how we manage, the management of the um, airway problem, whether it's upper or lower or tissue disease or even uh, controlling of breathing is all the same almost. So it's A, B, C, D, as we said, for airway, you have to maintain the position. So you do health tilt, chin lift, and then we will learn how to do it. We'll do the jaw thrust and we suction the nose and the mouth. And if there is a foreign body, we remove it. We might consider airway adjunct, such as oropharyngeal airway or nasopharyngeal airway. Very important for breathing to monitor the oxygenation. And provide oxygenation uh, should be heated. And uh, the delivery method, the interface, depend on the situation. We will learn in the ventilation course. So I'm going to pause this. But it's always a temporary measure. Um, uh, to give our direct oxygenation uh, before we uh, um, um, uh, use alternative, uh, uh, more respiratory support measure. We use inhaled medication and please avoid using nebulizer. Nebulizer being stopped from being used almost 20 years now. Okay, the nebulizer only indicated and it's equally indicated with the inhaler when you are less than two years. And even if less than two years, the inhaler is way better. There are many uh, reasons why inhaler is way better than, than nebulizer. The first one is the waste percentage. So when you do nebulizer, the waste percentage sometimes reach up to 75%. So 75% of the medication you are giving, it go away because it's, it's go, it, it evaporate outside. The second, it takes too long time, around 20 minutes to be finished. And third, it needs electricity and need maintenance and can fail. And third, it makes the place very crowded. While if you use an uh, inhaler, it takes like six seconds to finish and the waste is almost zero. So please use inhaler, don't use nebulizer. Even in ventilated baby, we use inhaler. Um, so we also, you might need to give a uh, positive, yeah, yes, Olaf, tell me, you're asking questions. Can, can, can I know what is the difference between the inhaler and nebulizer? I really don't know. How do you deliver the oh, so nebulizer? You, uh, there are many types of nebulizer. There is ultrasonic and there is membrane mesh and there is um, uh, uh, vabotham. So it depends on the type of the nebulizer that you're using. And what happened is you convert the medications and mix it with the, with the steam, and then it goes to the respiratory. The problem with that is uh, most of the, uh, of, the, of the steam will be deposited in the upper airway. And um, the other things, it will go from the side of the, uh, uh, of the mouth or the nose and you see the evaporation around the baby. And the third second is, is very noisy. And third, it takes about 15 to 20 minutes to finish. Okay, I need electricity. While the inhaler, it takes only 10 seconds to finish, uh, six seconds. So you just say one, two, three, four, five, six, and you're done. Okay, um, so the, the inhaler are very important, very, very, uh, very, very easy to use. We don't need electricity and can be implanted by the mother. So it, it makes the loads on the nurses way less. And it's easily applied in the car, on the mountain, in the house. You don't need it. And the same spacer uh, with mask or with a mouthpiece, you can use it for two years. Same one, okay? And uh, you can use the standard inhaler uh, of whether it's a Ventolin or it's a Pratropion Promide, and even you can give the inhaled steroid. So it's easy to be used, and if the baby you can apply it not because the baby's scared, you can use the mouthpiece and the baby will suck it like he sucked the bottle. So it's easy to use, uh, whether you are giving salbutamol or epinephrine or uh, 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 
epiratropium bromide. Did I answer your question? Uh, I mean, inhaled by like a puff-like machine. I have seen it before, or it's something else. I don't know what is the exact difference between the inhaler and nebulizer. To me, are the same. The machine. I... Oh no, they are not the same at all. Have you seen spacer? No. Okay, I will show you then. Let me stop sharing. I will show you the spacer because that's a very good. Thank you. So I show you spacer with mask, and I can show you video. Let me share. Do you see the my slide now? Yes, I am seeing. That's an inhaler with a space and a mask. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, and if you go right spacer with mask and click on the videos, okay, you will see the video how, how it's been. Okay. Used. Mm -hmm. You see, one, one, one third of the medicine only when you don't use it, like when you use nebulizer. So this is an inhaler with a spacer and mask, but also you can use um, Okay, or you can use a, a mouthpiece without not mouse, you can use mouthpiece. You see, mouthpiece. See? Yes, bigger baby with mouthpiece, even for adults. Now we use a spacer, we don't use inhaler directly like an adult because there is when you do it directly there should the patient has to do mm -hmm. some procedure you know have to get and then hold the breath and you know do something like that so people stopped using the inhaler and adult directly so now we use either mask or we use mouthpiece and children and adults use the same yes so okay. tell me you're asking question thank you I you did. You answered my question. Thank you. You're the same person. Any question? Any other question? Okay. Now, do you understand the difference? Do you want me to show you the nebulizer too? Have you seen nebulizer? Yes, I've seen the nebulizer. It's available okay. in our hospital. Yeah. And it's available. The spacer is available in Erbil too. So it's available. And it's, I've been using it since I came here. Because I was surprised to, to know that we're still using the nebulizer, while last time I've used a nebulizer is probably 25 years ago. I was very surprised that we're still using the nebulizer. Now, not, not wrong, it's not wrong, but it's less, way less effective. You will see like a dramatic improvement when you use a spacer. Okay, so the management of the obstruction is upper airway, we reduce the swelling, we, the baby agitated because of hypoxia, we give some minimized agitation, whether non-pharmacological or pharmacological, we can use airway adjuncts such as um, um, oral or nasal airway, we can use surgical procedure, and we have to treat specific, whether it's a croup or it's anaphylaxis or it's a foreign body airway obstruction, whatever the reason. Uh, medications. I, I don't want to go to the doses. I know you guys are know how to treat croup very well, so I'm going to pass it for sake of time. Um, but when we have a croup and we do hand, hand on, we, shall, we will know, but I'm sure you guys know how to treat, but it's the same principle. And uh, we can... Uh, uh, do you guys know the difference between racemic and L-epinephrine? So there is racemic epinephrine and L epinephrine. Do you guys know the difference?
Okay, if you guys don't know the difference, please go and read it today and let's discuss it next time because I've, I've also surprised that some of you don't know the difference between racemic and um, L-epinephrine. So please go and read it, write racemic and L-epinephrine and you'll see the study that demonstrate. And it was like, at some point, the racemic uh, epinephrine was like a fashion. Everybody is giving racemic. Um, but then they've discovered that LAP and racemic are the same. So no, they go back. So you can give it the epinephrine. You can give it IM, subcutaneous. You can give it inhale, inhaled by uh, inhaler with um, matter dose inhaler with a spacer. You can use it also by nebulizer. We can use the auto injector. And we have two, many types of um, uh, auto injectors depend on where you are looking. So we have, we have uh, adrenaclylic and we have the OVQ and we have epinephrine, epinephrine uh, junior, uh, which is 0.1 and 0.3 is the EpiPen. Um, so these are like growth hormone. If you have seen a growth hormone or insulin, you can even give it through the dress. You don't need to undress the patient. So I'm not gonna pass, discuss this because I guys, I'm sure guys know how to use that. Um, uh, for anaphylaxis, bronchospasm, remember please use matter dose inhaler with a spacer and try to avoid nebulizer as much as you can. However, if you are less than two years, you probably might need it. Um, whenever you have anaphylaxis, you need to make sure that you have uh, ETT, and uh, you need to ventilate, and when you ventilate obstruction, you need to prolong the expiration to evacuate the air from the body and avoid air trapping and probably um, hyperinflation and maybe even pneumothorax. It's very important to know that. Um, now, when you have anaphylaxis um, and um, there is obstruction with or without anaphylaxis, you might have other symptoms of anaphylaxis affecting other organs uh, more than the respiratory, such as the uh, cardiovascular, even the GI or the CNS. So you need to treat hypotension if hypotension um, and end. And it's a very good medication in inotropes in uh, anaphylaxis is epinephrine infusion because in anaphylaxis, you have affect both the cardiac and the uh, uh, peripheral uh, vascular resistance. You probably have both systolic and diastolic blood pressure low and you have the, the difference or the pulse pressure remained constant. Uh, so epinephrine is a good choice because it work on both. Norepinephrine usually when you have distributive shock. Um, uh, you might need to give anti 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 uh, allergy such as diphenhydramine. Uh, you might need to give H2 blocker such as ranitidine. Um, you might need to give, and please remember, don't give cortiso cortisone and asthma, okay? Don't give cortisone in asthma. Cortisone will not function very well in asthma. So please remember that you either give oral prednisolone or methylprednisolone. And if you don't have both, then you can use dexamethasone. Now, hydrocortisone is only for diseases in the blood. It's not meant for bronchospasm. It might work, but it's not work as, as good. And so please, when you have asthma, do not give hydrocortisone. Prednisolone and prednisolone is better to be used one dose, not two doses. But if you cannot, you can use it two doses. Okay. Is that clear? Yes. Yes, yeah, doctor. Yes. Yeah. Uh, you have my sorry, help for him, buddy. Go ahead. Go ahead, please. Uh, you mean just uh, the matter of uh, potency of the steroid? That's why we will not use uh, hydrocortisone. It's not the really, potency. Really... You can. You can use the you can use the equivalent dose. So there is a table to show you the equivalency of the strength of different type of steroid. But methylprednisolone goes to the tissue more than the blood, and that's why it's very important to use it when you have a problem in the tissue rather than in the blood. So if you have hypotension, and you want to give steroid for hypotension, the best choice is cortisol, hydrocortisol. When you have uh, anaphylaxis and you have uh, cardiac is not function and you want to give a steroid hydrocortisone. When you have sepsis and you want to give a steroid, you give a hydrocortisone. But when you have a tissue problem and you want to, and a steroid is indicated, prednisolone is the best choice. And that's why in asthma, the prednisolone is the best choice. And if you want to do IV, it's a methylprednisolone. 
Yeah, thank you. Okay, it's not a matter of potency. Yeah, okay, thank you. Because you always can use the same equivalent or converting potency table. Okay? And you guys can go and check it in Google or in UpToDate or in uh, Sinhal or in uh, um, um, uh, PubMed or whatever, like the, or Google Scholar, whatever the uh, uh, search engine or even uh, Cochrane. So whenever, whatever the search engine, medical search engine you use, you check and if I'm wrong, just text me. Okay, now foreign body is very important to intervene whether, and then you need to decide whether it's a, uh, like complete uh, obstruction or incomplete. So if the child is conscious, you try the maneuver to take it out. But if you're unconscious, then remember your initial assessment is to do CPR, regardless of what happened. Huh? And please don't do your, your hand inside the mouth blindly. Okay. Now, lower airway, you will have a bronchiolitis and asthma. And um, remember... Um, Airway A, B, C, D, same, no problem, no difference. And also remember, please don't give inhaled steroid in asthmatic attack because it causes bronchospasm. Inhaled steroid is only for prevention. Okay, don't give, because I was surprised that I have seen asthmatic patient on inhaled nitric oxide, inhaled, sorry, steroid. So please, because a steroid is particles and it causes bronchospasm. Inhaled steroid is to prevent the um, asthmatic attack, not to treat asthmatic exacerbation. So when there is airway obstruction or there is a respiratory problem, whether it's a distress or failure due to asthma, same airway, same maneuver, breathing, same, circulation, and so on. And it depends on the situation. So please don't use nebulizer, use matter dose inhaler. It's way better. And try it yourself. You'll see the difference. So you can give one or two buffs. It's five seconds. So you just push one puff, change push, and then count one, two, three, four, five, six, and you're done. It's easy. And keep the nurses less busy. And it's more effective. And waste rate less than 5%. Well, the waste rate in nebulizer is more than 75%. Now, if you're more severe, you might need to give um, more than inhaled uh, you know, oxygen and inhaled uh, ventolin. You need to give ibratrobium bromide. And if that's not available, you need steroid. And please remember, steroids are very important in asthma. And one of the reasons why the these babies transfer to PICU and might end with intubation is delay use of steroid. It's very important to give steroid as early as possible. Okay, and remember to give steroid that deal with the tissue. And then if they give the steroid and there is no response, which is very unlikely, you need more than oxygen. You need respiratory support, such as non-invasive uh, respiratory support like CPAP or high flow nasal cannula. High flow nasal cannula, usually we give 0.5 liter per minute for each year. And they consider CPAP if you can. And if the baby agitated, you might need to give some sedation. And please do blood gas because saturation show you the oxygen and if you have co2 and oxygen you have a ventilation problem so medication will not help you need a respiratory support whenever your co2 is high so please do co2 and your co2 might be low in early because of tachypnea blowing out the co2 but once the obstruction more the co2 will accumulate chest x-ray will not help and please no need for steroid no need for antibiotics in asthma Please, and if you start antibiotics, then remember, no antibiotics without blood culture, because you need to decide when to stop the antibiotics. And the best way to stop antibiotics when the culture is negative after 48 hours. So please, asthma is not infection. Okay, don't treat, no baby was have pneumonia and can sit. 
if the baby pneumonia and the pneumonia causing respiratory distress, almost always this baby is very sick. So there is no baby who's sitting in the chair with respiratory distress and the cause is pneumonia. No way. It's not even one per thousand possibility. If the baby is sitting and he's in distress, this is bronchospasm. Okay, and this is not pneumonia and antibiotics is not necessary. So please remember that. Okay, so in asthma, please, if you have impending respiratory failure, you need to administer oxygen to keep saturation. Okay, and then you can do continuous nebulization or continuous inhaler every five, 10 minutes. IV steroid, please. And you might need to consider uh, beta agonist IV. Please don't forget the CPAP, non-invasive, and don't forget that you can intubate. Once you intubate, you need to sedate, remember that. And usually it takes 12 to 36 hours that we can extubate asthmatic patient after relief of obstruction. Okay, and this is a very good table. I'm not gonna discuss it because I've discussed everything. Okay. Now, what are the resources when you treat? Please use correct mask. And the mask should be from the tip of the chin to the, from the tip of the chin to the um, nasal bridge at the point where, where the two eyes meet. So this is the good seal, okay? So the correct position, okay? We can use self-inflated uh, ventilation bag, which we call it ambu bag. And this does not need flow and can provide good oxygenation if we use a reservoir, okay? And if we don't, it, it somewhere give oxygen, connected to oxygen, it can give oxygen somewhere between 30 to 80 percent, but if we use reservoir, it can reach up to 100 percent. And remember, the flow, please, should be 15 mL per minute. Okay, very important. Sorry, 15 liter per minute, not mL. This is wrong. And remember, when you use the ambu bag, use the safety pop-up valve because once you press, because we tend, human being, when the babies become tired, to inflate more, as more as much as we can. And uh, you might cause a problem. So use your safety valve to open the pressure if it's become more than 45 centimeter water. Please use appropriate size bag. Don't use, so you have 250, you have 500, and you have 750, so please don't use more than 500 size. Okay, and please connect the manometer, the gauge that measures how much pressure you're giving. And put the baby in a sniffing position. Okay, and the sniffing position means the tip of the nose and the tip of the chin are at the same level. We can use the inflation bag, flow inflation bag, which is the anesthesia bag that need pressure. The good things with this, it can give up to 100% oxygen and it will indicate if there is a good seal because if there is no good seal of the mask, it won't work. And But in the downside, it needs flow, okay? And it's good because you can blend the oxygen and the air, okay? And then you put the baby in a sniffing position. Look at the position here. Okay, so wrong position. You can see the tip of the nose is higher than the tip of the chin. Okay, look at this here. Look at the tip of the nose and the tip of the chin. Okay, sometimes you need to use shoulder roll or even head roll to paint awkward position. And please hold the baby in C and E. The C is around the mask. And the E, which is the three fingers, is at the jaw, okay? So please remember C and E pose technique when you hold the baby, okay? And remember, please, when you push the mask, you push against your fingers, not against the baby. So you pull up from here and you push from here. So you are as if you are grabbing your hand. Don't push down because you will obstruct the airway. So, okay, so three fingers you push up, and the C finger, the C shape, which is the 
the index and the thumb is pushing down. So these fingers are pushing on this finger, not on the baby. Okay? Remember, you need tie seal. And you please look at the chest rising. And that's why you need the baby to be exposed. Okay? So if you have good ventilation, mean you have a good chest rise, saturation is okay, heart rate is important. If the heart rate is okay, you are doing good. If the heart rate is not okay, then you have a problem. You might need exhalation, a CO2 exhalation, uh, a capnography or entitled CO2 or even calorimeter to make sure that the, you're actually ventilating. Of course, the baby will... Uh, um, um, the baby will um, be pink and good color, okay? And if there is no good improvement, we check Mr. Suba. Do you guys know what's Mr. Suba? Yes, doctor. Yeah, so please don't forget Mr. Suba. And check your oxygenation and look if you are obstructing or not and if you are ventilating correctly. Now, intubation is very important to consider. If you cannot provide effective ventilation, whether by bag or by CPAP, you cannot provide good oxygenation and your CO2 is rising, you need to intubate. And please use RSI. Do you guys know what is RSI, rapid sequence intubation? No, it isn't here. here. Okay, so RSI is vital. Okay, no baby should be intubated without RSI. We will learn, we will have a session about RSI. Okay, when you do intubation, you need cardiorespiratory monitor. And please use and please use a mask and gloves. Okay, don't intubate without that. And please put Face shield if you have to protect your eyes from the infection. Never intubate without cardiorespiratory monitor. Never intubate without pulse oximetry. And you can uh, you can monitor the blood pressure. So you put the blood pressure every five minutes to check the blood pressure. You might also need entitled CO2 of three types, either capnography or entitled CO2 or calorimeter, and we'll see all that. You need an IV before you intubate. And if you don't have an IV, then you need IO. And if you don't have both and the baby is crashing, you can use nasal midazolam to intubate. You must have oxygen source. You should must have the bag and mask if you fail. And it's normally to fail, okay? My success rate in intubation is 80%. So every 10, I fail too. That's normal. If you try twice, give the way to others. Okay, and we should have a, a, a plan, a backup plan to manage the, um, and score the difficult airways, okay? Do you know Mambani scoring system or no? Have you heard of, of a Mambani scoring system? No, we didn't hear. Yeah. So that a Mambani is, a, is an Indian physician who scored the difficult airway. We'll, we'll learn that, inshallah, with ventilation and management of difficult airway. And remember, you need suction because once you intubate and there is fluid, you need to clear your way to intubate. You might need aeropharyngeal and nasopharyngeal airway. Okay? You need something to fix the ATT. And the best is to use bar. Okay? ATT bar. It's better than using um, a, a gauze. Uh, because in the goes that ETT will go to an angle of the mouth. Okay, but the best position is to put the, at the upper lip in the middle of the mouth. And to do that, you need a bar and the bar will be fixed on the cheek. And then there is like a, 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 a handle and at the handle, we stick the ETT. It's very important. Then you need to decide the size of the ETT, whether you're using, uh, what is size? And whenever you measure the size, and the length for how long you will put inside the ATT, then uh, you need uh, to um, uh, uh, prepare one size above and one size below. And you need to measure how much inside you go. And then the intubator, the one who's intubating, should decide to use a stylet or not. Okay, you need laryngoscope, and please, you should have both straight and curved blade. 
also lately we will have also we have video laryngoscope okay and you should always have a backup laryngoscope we cannot go to a resource station and we have only one because it can fail and we need a backup battery okay and we need a pressure monitor to measure the cuff when you do a, when you use a cuff tube and you know they have to know how much you uh, how much uh, air or fluid to inflate the, the the bag of ETT it's very important to have three five and ten mil syringes okay we need adhesive or cloth tape or commercial ETT holder or ETT bar. It's very good that you can use it. It's it's very you need towels and 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 sheets, okay. And you need a plan and tools for difficult airway. You need a backup plan. You need also to have an anesthesia person or a otolaryngologist to manage difficult airway. Okay. Any questions so far? I'm just moving fast because we will take all this in the future. Questions? Am I moving fast or you're okay? Because I'm just giving you messages, not like teaching you the topic. Mm, questions? Clear. Clear. Great. So shock is inadequate oxygen going to the body to meet the tissue demand, it's oxygen and other substrate. Okay, so what is the component of tissue oxygenation? We have the oxygen, which need the hemoglobin level and also the percentage of the hemoglobin that carrying oxygen. Okay, but sometimes that's not sufficient because the hemoglobin is low or oxygen is low, but sometimes the demand is higher. Okay, so you need first good oxygen and when you have a good oxygen, we need good hemoglobin and we need a percentage that goes and the demand should be less than the need. Also, you need a good blood flow and blood flow depends on the stroke volume. And the stroke volume is amount of blood pushed by the heart in one cycle and you need to multiply it by heart rate and then divide it by the weight to get the cardiac output. And you need also appropriate uh, tone in the blood vessels because remember the systole is the contractility of the heart and the diastole is the collapsibility of the blood vessels. Okay. Now the, the stroke volume need preload and we'll take hemodynamics and we'll take echo. I will teach you how to do echo and uh, how to do left and right side function assessment. Okay. We will learn all that and then how to calculate the peripheral vascular resistance. Okay. So the preload is the amount of the blood coming to the heart from the venous side. Okay, and you need the contractility. The contractility have two, two parts, the volume of the ventricle and the strength of the muscle. Okay, and then you need also the afterload, which is the resistance against pushing of the heart. It's peripheral and ventricular and, and, and pulmonary. Okay, and remember the compensatory mechanism. Okay, before the compensatory, we have, we have the autoregulation and we need to learn what is autoregulation and how we check the autoregulation because if autoregulation change, then, then the baby is going to have shock. Okay, and that's what we call it non-planted sign, which is the sign that appeared before even the baby become tachycardiac. We will learn that in the future, inshallah. And uh, so remember compensatory mechanism to increase cardiac output is going tachycardia. Okay, and get vasoconstriction. So you can increase the volume inside, increase contractility, increase um, venous smooth muscle tone. Okay, so preload, contractility, and afterload give us the stroke volume. And that give us the cardiac output. So cardiac output with oxygen carrying in the hemoglobin, that means enough hemoglobin, enough oxygen, and less demand give us the, okay, um, uh, cardiac oxygen delivery and remember also the blood pressure contributing and remember the blood pressure is only one part okay so the cardiac output time the systemic vascular resistance you get the blood pressure and remember please we human beings are variable we never fix so please remember when you plot your heart rate and the heart and the heart rate or the blood pressure are fixed not changing not variable then, then you have a problem before even signs, even if normal blood pressure or normal heart rate. 
and the shocks are many times, okay? And remember, they compensated shock. You get normal blood pressure, but the perfusion is not good. Okay, and remember how to measure for blood pressure. Um, um, although we use these equations, but that these equations are incorrect. Okay, so if we have increased heart rate, okay, and increased systolic vascular resistance and increased renal or supplantic vascular tone, when we evaluate, each one has an an. an, an and ask an, 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 a clue to the problem. So if you increase heart rate, I mean we it comes from the heart. You get tachycardia, increase systemic vascular resistance, it comes from the skin and peripheral circulation. Okay, and the and the pulse. Okay, so how we assess the skin um, in, uh, increase systemic vascular resistance is uh, 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 we we get vasospasm, so you get cold area because no blood coming and no temperature. Uh, you can get pale or the vasomotor are not stable, so you get muddled, okay? And you get less sweat. Um, so you can get peripheral vascular resistance and then the uh, sign of evaluation is delayed capillary refill and weak pulses, okay? You can also, if the pulse are weak and the periphery, the systolic will go low and diastole will go up and then you will get narrow pulse pressure. Remember that. And um, if, if, if uh, increase uh, renal supplanting vascular resistance, you get oliguria. Okay, now if it's if it's intestine, you get vomitus and ileus. Okay, we have many types of shock. We have hypovolemic, distributive, cardiogenic, and obstructive. And in neonate, we get also something called uh, shunt, okay, or PDA uh, shock. And, uh, you know, there are many reasons for hypovolemic shock. I don't want to go. I think, I think you know the causes of hypovolemia. Okay, um, so um, again, I can, the, the management of the hypovolemic shock is not different. It's airway, breathing, circulation, disability and exposure, same, no, no difference, okay? Because I'm not gonna give you that distributive shock is due to peripheral problem, okay? So it's either neurogenic shock due to medication or injury or, 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 or toxoid, or it's anaphylaxis or it's septic shock, okay? So it, it, it manifests itself by vasodilatation and some people call it warm shock. Again, the management is the same. Airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Septic shock is not different from anaphylaxis. And the, the, the difference, anaphylaxis and even septic shock can be combined. So it can be peripheral uh, or warm shock, but also can be cardiac. And I know, I know I'm, I'm sure very well, um, uh, uh, you know uh, how to diagnose shock and sepsis. And please remember the difference between septic and sepsis, okay? So don't call septic workup because that septic workup mean your workup is dirty, while sepsis workup mean blood work for sepsis, okay? So remember the signs of sepsis, which is, you know, increase white PC count, increase inflammatory markers. Okay, so what's the benefit of inflammatory markers? Do you guys know? What is the benefit of inflammatory markers in sepsis? No benefit. The only benefit is a prolonged antibiotic use. It has zero benefit. It just increases harm of the baby. So ESR and CRP, remember them. They have zero benefit. Okay, white BC count, you can get metabolic acidosis and you can get respiratory alkalosis. Anaphylaxis shock, remember, there is signs of allergy and it can affect more than the cardiac system because it can affect the intestine and in kidney and the skin, okay, and the brain. So love, yeah, you're asking a question. Go ahead, please. Um, in septic shock, so how do we follow up the patients if you do not use the CRP or ESR? Whether they, follow, up uh, follow up what? You want to follow, follow up what? Up uh, either the baby is going to the you know, better or the the condition is going to be better. You, 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 you don't have answer. I know that. See? No. So you want to follow up exactly what? By sign 
baby is improving. Oh, you improve, you get better lactate. You get better white VC. You get, get better blood pressure. You get no need for ventilation. Okay, your weight is Perfect. going good. And the baby starts feeding. And your cardiac function is okay. Your peripheral vascular resistance improve. Your blood pressure improve. What CRB will tell you? Zero benefit. What exactly will tell you? Okay, the baby deteriorating and the CRP is improving. What's the pro the benefit? Zero benefit. Do you guys know that if you are single, your CRP is high? Do you guys know that? If you are not married, your CRP will be high. If you are not happy, your CRP will be high. And if you don't eat in the morning, your CRP will be high. Mm -hmm. there, are, there are benefit of the CRP, but I will discuss it later, not now. But... In septic shock, CRB have zero benefit. I rarely ever send CRB. I send CRB only when the baby is not improving and the culture is negative and I want to continue antibiotics. So I do two or three CRB to decide how long I will continue antibiotics, five days or seven days. Yeah, so love, you have a question or somebody no, else? Thank uh, how was, how was, Kawa? Uh, yeah, dear doctor, thank you very much. Dear doctor, regarding uh, serum procalcitonin, uh, which one more accurate, serum procalcitonin or blood culture? Uh, sometimes we know uh, sensitivity of blood Zero culture. Zero benefit. Very... Zero benefit. Both. Not even 1% benefit of procalcitonin. Even? Zero. Not even 1%. Blood culture, blood culture, and blood culture. Blood culture, but uh, most of the times, blood culture may be negative. Uh, as such cases, clinical. No, that is incorrect. Absolutely incorrect. That is absolutely incorrect. We go to the evidence. Only twenty percent of the sepsis are culture negative, which means if you have ten babies on antibiotics in a unit, you should have eight culture positive. And if but you have less locality, than vice versa, let me, finish, locality, let, me let me give negative. you the idea. Okay. Now, if you have 10 babies and you do blood culture, okay, and you are on 10 babies in the unit, they are on, on antibiotics, and you have less than, less than eight culture positive, you're just overusing antibiotics. Because baby can be sick, many things other than antibiotics. Okay, so... It, it's impossible that you have the culture negative sepsis is more than the culture positive. You simply, you simply don't know how to follow your baby. Okay, so I I have rarely ever I see death in babies in a newborn babies rarely ever, and I rarely ever use antibiotics. I'll give you an example: if a baby born by C-section and he's premature. Okay, and the mother has no leukocytosis or fever, no sign of chorioaminitis, and the baby delivered with respiratory distress. What is the diagnosis? It's TTN or RDS. RDS. There is no need for antibiotics. From where the infection will come? But, no uh... but if the mother in pain, then yes, because pain, labor, can be triggered by infection. Then you need antibiotics, but you do blood culture. And after 36 hours, I mean three doses, ambicillin, one dose, gentamicin. And please don't start cefotaxim. Cefotaxim is not a good antibiotics. Ambicillin and gentamicin is way better than cefotaxim. Cefotaxim is only for community acquired infection. It's not meant to be given in newborn babies. And please don't change antibiotics when the baby is not improving. If the baby is not improving, he needs support. Because sometimes say, doctor, we are giving antibiotics and the baby is not improving. Okay, well, are you giving ventilatory support? Are you giving cardiorespiratory support? Are you giving CNS support? Are you giving fluid? Are you giving total new parenteral nutrition? Are you feeding the baby? If you're doing all that and the baby is improve, not improving, yes, there might have, might, might. But you're not feeding the baby. You are not giving TBN. You are not doing ventilatory support. You are not sedating the baby. You are not allowing the baby to sleep. And then you tell me baby is not improving. Oh, the, the, the issue is antibiotics. And you go in a vicious circle until the baby pass away. Do you understand, sir? Yeah, I get the point. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. 
Okay, so when you treat, please remember, please remember to treat the baby A, B, C, D, E, not only antibiotics, okay? Please remember that baby need to sleep. And if the baby does not sleep for 48 hours, they will die. Believe me or not, they will die from not sleeping. Okay? Because Haurez is one asleep today. And I will call him at midnight. Okay? Then he won't sleep and I will call him at 2 a.m. And then he won't sleep and I will call him at 4 a.m. And then he won't sleep and I call him at 6 a.m. Next day, Haurez will not able to function. Have you tried this before or not? Yes. And if you don't sleep next day too, and if I deprive you from sleep for two or three days, you will literally die. You cannot. So remember when the baby deteriorates, remember the uh, uh, neurophysiological development of the baby. Remember the noise. Remember the light. Remember the pain. Remember the sleep. Remember the touch. So, for example, Haurez is sleeping naked, okay? And he's under the blanket. And then I came with my cold hand and put my hand on him. What will happen to his heart rate? What will happen to his brain? What will happen to his blood pressure? Haurez, what will happen? Yeah, uh, maybe cause tachycardia. Maybe cause tachycardia, uh, you cause hypotension, you cause okay. arrhythmia. Yeah. Okay, you cannot touch a baby who's sleeping. Okay, remember that cluster of care and minimize the touch per day to four times per day, not more than that. Otherwise, they won't able to function. So remember, don't tell me baby deteriorate and not giving ventilatory support, not giving cardiorespiratory support, not giving nutrition and not giving sedation, and not getting analgesia, and not allowing the baby to sleep. Noise, light, and touching the baby, okay? Once you do all that, and the baby is not deteriorating and culture negative, then yes, you might think of culture negative sepsis. And then you have to repeat the blood culture. And it's impossible to have two blood culture, and you still insist that you have culture negative sepsis. If you have two septum, and if you have, the, again, do third culture. So, and then between each one, and even if you have culture positive, you might be contamination. So you will not, I never use antibiotics on a single blood culture. I use two side blood culture. And if one positive and the other one negative, it's contamination. Okay, so remember, please, antibiotics is not the solution. Antibiotics is chemicals. Antibiotics can kill the baby. Any more questions? Sorry, I stressed on this point and I lost the time. We have a neurogenic shock. There are many reasons of a neurogenic shock, such as trauma, okay? And we have the cardiogenic shock and caused by many diseases, myocarditis, cardiomyopathy. And remember, please, when it's a heart problem, the relation between the heart rate and the respiratory rate become a close. And when it's a respiratory, pro become wide, sorry. And when it's a respiratory problem, the relation between the heart rate and respiratory rate become close. So remember that, please. Okay, and again, the management is A, B, C, D, E. And when we have obstructive shock, okay, such as cardiac tamponade or pneumothorax or ductal dependent congenital heart disease or massive pulmonary embolism, okay, remember it will, the cardiac output will be low and you'll have increased systemic vascular resistance. So you'll have low systole, high diastole. Okay, so remember your pulse pressure will get smaller. Okay, and you lose your variability because the heart will become non-compressible. So between pulse and pulse variability will be less than 30%. And that's what we call it smart monitoring. And the management again, A, B, C, D, E. Okay. So I'm not going to go to the, the, to the details of that. Okay, so how we open, remember, patency, open, maintainable, non-maintainable, respiratory rate, heart rate, respiratory effort, all the same, like we've discussed before. Okay, so I don't want to go to the details of shock because we will have a complete session on the shock and how we treat shock. Okay. So remember how to use inotrop, dopamine. Dopamine affect both cardiogenic and peripheral. Epinephrine affect both. 
dobutamine affect the heart and it, it uh, might decrease the systemic vascular resistance. Remember milirinon, it decreased the pulmonary vascular resistance, but at the same time cause hypotension. So that's why you need to prime the circulation before you use milirinon. And remember to do um, an echo, a hemodynamic assessment. We can use vasodilators when we have uh, uh, to decrease the systemic vascular resistance, okay, and improve venous return. So if you have a low cardiac output, remember to use vasodilators. Okay, we can use vasopressors such as epinephrine, but epinephrine affect the heart, but we can use norepinephrine affect the periphery. And we can use vasopressin, desmopressin, and that depends whether we have edema or not, because once we have edema and we have low sodium, that will be exaggerated by vasopressin. But if the sodium is 140, 150 and dehydration, norepinephrine in addition to the volume is the best solution. We will know about inotropes Remember to position, remember oxygenation, remember ventilation, remember to prime the circulation. And how we know the circulation? We know the variability. We do lung ultrasound to see A-lines because remember more A-lines mean more air, mean less volume. And if you have hypotension and more A-lines mean you need volume. But if you have hypotension and you have more B-lines, B-line mean fluid. And that's myth like a curly, curly, B -lines, uh, curly lines on X-ray. That's mean you have a cardiogenic shock and you need Lasix. Okay, remember, co correct the metabolic arrangement when you have a sick baby, hypoglycemia, hypocalcemia, hyper metabolic acidosis. Okay, general management, remember, we don't have something called RCU or CCU. We don't do that anymore. It's a PICU, it's the whole body care. There is nothing called RCU and there is nothing called CCU. It's a PICU. It's a pediatric intensive care unit because we care the whole body. We don't care but only the respiratory or the lung. Okay, so remember how to monitor, please, the heart rate, the saturation, the blood pressure, the mental status, the temperature, the urine output. Okay, remember the specific treatment of shock, whether it's a poisoning or dehydration or hemorrhage. Check the CBC to look at the leukocyte. Check glucose, to look at electric light. Check the lactate, do arterial blood gas. Check the uh, venous saturation and check the arterial saturation. So we know oxygen consumption rate and so on. Okay, so I don't want to go to this, uh, what is hypovolemic, what's hemorrhagic, what's non-hemorrhagic, what's distributive shock, because we will learn that on a specific topics and cardiogenic shock and how to differentiate from distributive shock, okay? So remember, it's the same principle. It's a block of time, okay? And um, you manage the baby, uh, whether the baby regain consciousness or not, and then you manage accordingly. Um, um, depend on the your initial assessment, primary assessment, secondary assessment, and investigation. Okay, remember that you might need a vascular access, and if you don't have, then you need your uh, intraosseous. Um, and it's very important to have this. Do you guys have this with you? Each resident should have this one. Okay, do you guys know? Do you have a solo... Um, uh, uh, tape measure, do you have it? We don't yes, have yet. Yeah, you have need to buy it. No. You guys need no. to buy it or print it. It's very important, okay, because it tells you, summarize everything to you. Okay, it tells you the equipment you need and it's color coded and you tell your resuscitation bag that you can use and the mass size and use and the airway size you use, the laryngoscope type and the ETT size and ETT length and section pressure catheter and the cuff with an IV catheter and intraosseous and nasogastric tube and urinary catheter and the chest tube size. So it tells you, it summarize all everything to you from a newborn to, although I don't like to use it in newborn, I like other, other measurement, but it's very important to use. So I'm gonna stop here, okay? I think we have one more session or two more sessions and we will finish management of acutely sick child. Then we will take the management, it's only one session, management of acutely sick newborn. 